You know what I realized some time ago? I've been doing this on Facebook for, you know, several months. I started every other week, and I graduated once a week, and then I've gone twice a week, and I'll probably elongate that a little bit. Because you're so receptive. The audience is everything. Uh, without your ears, I'm just sitting here in a room talking away. Now, um, normally I do these live, um, and you call in with your comments, cheers, jeers, etc., and I so appreciate that. And there'll be thousands of you that uh, bounce by and watch this, but the reaches, as you've seen maybe, have gone on to tens of thousands of people. So you're forwarding these to your friends. They're enjoying them also. What I try and do is take polysyllable science and work it down to, you know, inflammation, swelling, you know. Um, work it down to where you and I can better understand it because I've worked in operating rooms. Uh, I, I've worked next to some incredible doctors that are well known. And the words that they use were so huge, I'd often end up back, you know, in the 60s and 70s, I'd go back to a dictionary. What in the world does that word mean? And then I'd begin putting it all together. I'm not live today. I'm gone. I'm traveling with my family right now. But I wanted to keep that commitment to you every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. And so what I'm going to do today I think is so unique. What I realized is on TV, I've been teaching this for 17 years. And thousands of you have written in. You've seen the, the testimonials here on my website or, or in Facebook. You've said you've saved my life. And you're probably thinking, well, yeah, okay, okay. Folks, when you understand fungus, you understand medicine, and you understand nutrition. Having said that, let's flip that coin. Tails. When you don't understand fungus, you're a nice, caring, loving physician, nurse, health practitioner, clinical nutritionist, but you don't fully understand medicine. And I'm gonna go over that with you today. And nutrition, you know, if you think corn is the healthiest food in the American diet, you wanna stay tuned. I'm not going to begrudge anyone. I'm going to try and teach you what I learned the past 50 years in this field. Okay? My education began when I got back from Vietnam. Uh, I was a corpsman. Uh, uh, the Marines don't have medics. The Marines use corpsmen. And they train us for, you know, a couple of years before we go to Vietnam. Kind of like a nurse. You end up in Vietnam, you got a medical pack, you got morphine, you got IV bags and so forth. And you just pray every day somebody doesn't get hit because you're tired of seeing people without arms and people were hurting with shrapnel throughout their body. So I spent a year, 1970, 71, I came home and I was sick. And literally all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put me back together again. One doctor who's a friend of mine recommended cortisone. I thought that was a life-saving drug. My skin stopped bleeding. My depression kind of cleared up. I had no idea, folks, no idea. And this is where science is today. We don't know why your elbow hurts, but we're going to inject some cortisone in it. That was 50 years ago. Yeah, it still works today. That'll be $800. What? My whole goal in teaching you is not to... I didn't name my show Medicate the Condition. I named my TV show Know the Cause. You know what? I'm getting boils. What's the cause? Think you got a systemic bacterial problem that's ending up in sacs? They're called mycetoma, fungus in a sac right? And they mimic boils. The bad news is the doctor will give you antibiotics for the boil and it might get better for a few days. Antibiotics fuel fungus. So if these are fungal sacs, you're going to have more boils on down the road. Let's discuss this a little bit. Remember Roberta Flack? I love that song, Killing You Softly. Um, fungi can do that. Okay, here's today's message. When your doctor went through medical school, he had to take several courses called microbiology. Any of you have that in college? Do you remember that? Microbiology. In microbiology, you learn that much about bacteria, this much about viruses, and that much about fungus. Wait a minute. It can kill you? And they didn't learn anything? Ah, fingernail fungus, vaginal yeast, ringworm, jock itch, that kind of stuff every doctor learns. But the most important message I can give you today is this. They learn these are insignificant problems. Oh, who cares about a little ringworm, right? It, when, you, when the medical school beats it into your head, so to speak, and they don't beat their students, when they, when they g deposit this information, 
that there's thousands of antibiotics, so you better learn pharmacology. You better learn it because you don't know which antibiotic to put that patient on. First question I'd have is why is there thousands? If it kills bacteria, are there thousands of different kinds of bacteria? Not really. You know, not really that can impregnate the human. We see certain infections over and over again. Strep, you know. Why are there 10,000 antibiotics? That's because they don't work very long, and then you have to use a new one. And we're becoming resistant because we've gotten greedy. We put antibiotics in our beef and in our milk. You know where I'm going with this, so that's a whole other problem. Take-home messages. The medical schools teach doctors that bacteria is everything. Man, any infection, any time a fever goes up, white blood count goes up, you got a bacterial infection. No, you don't. Bacteria will cause the exact same symptomatology. Yep, your red blood, or I'm sorry, your white blood cell count goes up because they want to phagocytize. They want to digest that fungus in your body. And you run a fever, you can become febrile or feverish um, when you have a fungal infection. And how I wish this was taught in medical school. So today what we're going to learn is what doctors didn't. And I'm hoping that by the time we're done, that light bulb will come on, the aha moment, the epiphany will happen to you. Let's start by teaching you a little bit about basic fungi. Fungi look like human cells. They have a cell membrane, they have a nucleus, and the nucleus has DNA in it. Bacteria don't, viruses don't, other form of life doesn't. But fungi or yeast, yeast is a single cell fungi. Um, yeast and fungi look like human cells. This is why they do all the studies on yeast. If a yeast can take that drug, then a human can take that drug because their cells are very much like ours. Here's what I wish doctors knew. In 1963, any of you guys remember John F. Kennedy? 1963, I wasn't in Dallas, I was living in Los Angeles, uh, but he was murdered. He was assassinated here in Dallas, Texas, 1963. That same year, farmers <clears throat> in England were losing turkeys by the tens of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of turkeys dropped dead and they couldn't figure it out. This is a lucrative business. Animal meat is a lucrative business. To make it worse, I never studied this, but it was probably Thanksgiving time. You know, they needed a million turkeys and they were dropping like flies. <clears throat> they couldn't figure it out. Here's what they did wrong. Here's what they did wrong. They brought in veterinary pathologists. Go with me here, what happens when you die? They bring in a human pathologist. And they cut the turkey's bodies apart and said, wow, look at that heart. It must have been pumping twice as hard. Look at that liver. And same thing they do to us. They'll take out our liver and measure it and say, wow, a liver should weigh three pounds. Kaufman's weighed six pounds. Man, he died of liveritis, you know, or heartitis, you know. Why? Look at tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients or turkeys that have died. That's too late. What killed them? One day a food scientist came in England and he says, is this what you've been feeding all these chickens, all these turkeys? Yeah. What is it? Well, it's peanut meal. Peanut. Let's look at this under a microscope instead of all the dead turkey tissue. Why doesn't a pathologist do that in a hospital? Let's see what killed Doug instead of let's see what Doug is all cut up. It's backwards, folks. We're still doing it backwards. So they took this, looked at it under a microscope, and they saw an organism they had never seen before. Carefully checking it out, it was called aspergillus. It was a fungus. Wait a minute. In the peanuts? In the peanut meal. Aspergillus itself probably wouldn't have killed hundreds of thousands of turkeys. It's a mold, right? It grows on corn. Worse, zoom forward 50 years today, it's growing more on corn than ever before. But aspergillus is one of these organisms that off-gasses a poison. In this case, one of the poisons, and, and each mold or fungus can make five or 10 or 15 poisons. Aspergillus parasiticus. Aspergillus parasiticus makes a poison called aflatoxin. You with me now? Aflatoxin, A-F-L-A-T-O-X-I-N. Aflatoxin causes human liver cancer. Well, you can see how it killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of birds. I purport that it's killing hundreds of thousands of humans, but our pathologists, our diagnosticians, our oncologists haven't a clue. 
how in the world, they would say, if we didn't learn about it in medical school and an antibiotic can't kill it and you can't put a Band-Aid on it, how in the world could it be having this effect on so many people? Let me teach you. Mycotoxins, here's the harm they can do in the human body. Remember, you got a little fungus, a little round cell, right? It looks like a human cell. It spews, it off gases. It's actually a liquid, a solid, a gas, etc. They can be anything. But once inside your body or on a tree, anywhere, these guys can spew these poisons. And they don't immediately take you down. They kill you softly. They don't kill you hardly, right? It's not like eating the, the, the poisonous mushroom and dying, you know, two hours later. This stuff is insidious. This gets in your gallbladder. Well, you got to have your gallbladder taken out. What went wrong? We don't know. We got to take it out. Uh, well, your tonsils are bad. What went wrong? We don't know. We got to pull them out. Well, your leg looks really ugly. We got to cut that off. Why? We don't know. There's no money in telling you it's aspergillus or fusarium or any of these. You heard of candida? That's a single cell fungus, candida albicans. But there's candida tropicalis and many other kinds of yeast that are pathogenic. Important word. There are many fungi, like a mushroom, that isn't pathogenic. You don't eat a mushroom and three days later die. But if you ate this aspergillus enough, in two or three days, you could be dead. Not because of the aspergillus. And let me scare you even more. This is a natural process. God caused this process to occur. Fungus is saprophytic outdoors. It eats garbage. We now know it eats plastic. I mean, incredible. What's growing at Chernobyl? After the leak, the nuclear leak, fungus. It's remediating the nuclear fallout. This stuff eats anything, and it's happy to eat you too, only slowly. So now your arm hurts, and then your hip hurts, and then you're so depressed you want to cry, and then you can't see out of your right eye, and then you start getting ticks, and then you try and lift your hand to sign something, and they're shaking. Let me just read you what these fungi are. First, I'll read you out of a, a medical textbook. Clinical Mycology. This is a medical textbook. It is now uh, 21 years old. Man, it can drink. It's 21 years old now. It can drink alcohol legally. Built in, uh, this book was put together in 1996. I just want to read you, and by the way, it comes out of, you talk about, you know, ironclad institutions. Um, it's Duke University, Stanford University, Infect Division of Infectious Disease, San Jose, Department of Microbiology, the Royal Free Hospital, uh, Duke, again, Infectious Disease, Maryland, National Cancer Institute. That's who wrote this book. Big boys, okay? I want to read you some of the chapters. So you know where this fungus can grow. Fungal infections of the respiratory tract. All you got to do is live in a moldy home. Fungal diseases of the eye. Fungus must have heat and moisture to live. In your eye, there's something called vitreous humor. Don't experiment with this at home, but if you've ever poked yourself in the eye, you know a fluid came out of it. Vitreous humor. And oh, by the way, it's 70 degrees in this room. It's 30 degrees warmer in here, 98.6 degrees. So it has the warmth. Now all it needs is food. Your diet feeds it when your diet is bad. Okay? Infectious, uh, fungal infections of the kidney and those associated with kidney failure? You know, John, your kidneys are shot. Why? We don't know. Yeah, we do. As a matter of fact, it's written by some of the most credible institutions in the world. Doctor, did you ever read this? No. Where did you get this book? Shh. Keep it from the doctors, because then you have a cause. They might fix it instead of drugging it for 20 years. Chapter 14, fungal disease in genitourinary medicine, reproductive organs. Folks, I think we're passing this back and forth with a loving, normal relationship. I think we're passing this back and forth. One of the sidebars here is fungal prostatitis. You know what? You know what this book says? The most common yeast infection in a male's prostate is candida. That's vaginal yeast infection. Gee, wonder how a male gets it. Okay, we're an adult audience. You have to stop to think about this, folks, because your doctor won't get it. Okay, fungal infections of the GI tract, so common, it's amazing, because we've taken far too many billions of pounds of antibiotics, and that has adjusted the germs in the gut to a bad thing. Fungemia, wait a minute, wait a minute, emia, E-M-I-A, Doug, I used to know what that was in biology, we, it's called bloodstream. Fungus in the bloodstream, wouldn't you die? Every doctor I've ever met and I've ever spoken with says septicemia, which is bacteria in the bloodstream, kills you in a few days. 
fungi are symbionts. They can live very comfortably with you, like I said about the eye, as long as you give them food and you give them a warm place to grow. In a human fungal cell relationship, folks, no longer is the human cell the dominant cell. Fungus takes over. This is all documented. You find yourself looking in the refrigerator for anything chocolate, anything alcohol, anything sweet, any ice cream you can get, and you can't help it. You got a fungal infection. Your doctor won't know this. That's why I want to do this, folks. Not to demean him. These are people with twice my IQ. But if you don't learn it in medical school, how are you going to help your patients? You guys are already at home. I see you now going, aha, no wonder Aunt Mary has had the hiccups for 20 years. <laughs> What's hitting her esophagus, right? Could it be fungus? Okay, then chapter uh, fungemia, 12, chapter 12. Chapter 11, fungal infections of the ear, nose, and throat. And yet every ear infection, every nasal rhinitis, every throat infection, it's strep, give them an antibiotic. You fuel fungus when you throw more mold at it. And that's what antibiotics are. You can take an acute tonsil problem and almost assure it's going to become chronic by treating it the wrong way, by giving it an antibiotic if it's fungus. Okay. Next, chapter 10, fungal diseases of the skin. Chapter 9, fungus causing mass lesions in the central nervous system. What is dementia? What's Parkinson's? What's Alzheimer's? Causing mass lesions, sores in the myelin sheath on the nerves. Causing sores? Fungus can cause sores? They didn't learn it. Don't hold them responsible. Fungal meningitis, the coatings of the brain in the spinal column. I'll never forget, I think it was an anatomy and physiology class. I was talking to the girl sitting next to me in college, and the professor is a young guy, he's a really nice guy. He said, uh, Kaufman, uh, name the meninges for me. You know, I'm sitting there just going, wow, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. He said, no, no, you just, you just go ahead and answer that. Everybody knows that. What's the, the meninges, the three meninges? Gosh, I said the Nina, the Pina, the Santa Maria, and everybody laughed. Um, that isn't what they are. But these meningeal coatings over the nerves, uh, wh what is multiple sclerosis? Fungus can get into the meninges, into the surroundings, the, the nerves. Fungal disease of the heart. Fungal disease of the bone and joint. Uh, fungal therapies, diagnosis of fungal diseases. If you can get this book, Principles and Practice of Clinical Mycology, it's now four to six hundred dollars if you can find it. I'm glad I got it when the getting was good 21 years ago. This book costs $195. Now, let me just tell you, now that you know where fungus can grow, now that you know fungus off-gasses poisons, pathogenic fungus, not all of them, but pathogenic, and many of them are. I think we've found uh, two or, no, 400 pathogenic fungi now that make over 1,000 mycotoxins that your doctor doesn't know about. There isn't a drug in the pharmacy that neutralizes mycotoxins. Every bacteria and every other thing in the world, there isn't a drug in a pharmacy that neutralizes mycotoxins. But there is in health food stores, not a drug. There are natural things that God put here. Should we get in trouble with these fungi that shouldn't be aboard, we can erase them. Okay, now that you know that mycotoxins are dangerous, let me tell you how dangerous they are. They're capable of causing genetic diseases. They're called mutagenic. They're tremorigenic, capable of causing tremors and seizures. Whew. They're carcinogenic. They cause cancer. I think there's one known for suspected mycotoxins that they now believe cause cancer. They don't, folks, because your doctor has no idea. No oncologist knows what a mycotoxin is. Here's the good news. I've been called to teach them, so I'm traveling a lot toward the end of the year here teaching doctors about mycotoxins. They're teratogenic. That means they can cause defects in a developing embryo. What? They're neurotoxic, so they poison the nerves. They're nephrotoxic, so they poison the kidneys. They're hepatotoxic, so they poison the liver. They're hematoxic, so they poison the bloodstream. They're cardiotoxic, they poison the heart and the blood vessels. They're lymphotoxins, so they poison the lymphatic system. They're dermatotoxins, they poison the skin. And worse, the majority of them are immunosuppressive. 
they can reduce your immune system. There was a book, uh, I came to Dallas in, uh, 30 years ago now, 1987, with my young family at that time, uh, and I worked for a dermatologist, a guy I will always, he was a little gruff, I loved him, uh, the patients loved him, and those who worked around him loved him. I pulled this book off his shelf, he recruited me, he brought me from LA, he and a guy named Lou Kriegel, Dr. Lou Kriegel, an, an internal medicine guy, uh, brought me to Dallas from Los Angeles, five-year contract, that's all it was going to be. Then we were going to go home. I saw this book on his shelf, David Weekly, Dr. Weekly's shelf. It's called Principal, or no, Clinical and Immunologic Aspects of Fungal Diseases. Clinical in practice and immunologic aspects of fungal diseases. Johns Hopkins in Baltimore is where he bought this book. He paid $6.25 for it. Can you imagine how much books cost today? And his signature, I will take that to my grave with me. I love this guy. I want to read you what this book says in three different places. 1957. What were you doing 60 years ago now? Right? 1957. Hmm. And I made a slide of this. And I show this slide on my medical presentations to doctors. This book says whoops four times. When he passed, his wife, Tony, gave me this book, literally brought it to my office and said, David would have wanted you to have this. I was always digging in it. I couldn't believe what was in this book. Look at how much I've read of it. It's dog-eared and, you know, look, I, poor guy. You can't get another copy. I would love to find another copy. Circa 1957. Here's what the slide said. Sometimes cancer is mistaken for a fungal disease. I've learned in the past 10 years it's not sometimes. Uh, I feel it's many times. I think we are grossly overdiagnosing cancer. Page 11 in this book. Pulmonary coccidioideomycosis. Okay, it's, I'm trying to impress you now. Lung fungal infection is suggestive of metastatic malignancy. Page 11. This fungus called coccidio it's actually, the fungus is called coccidio imitus. It causes a disease called coccidio ideomycosis. Um, it's a lung fungal condition. Your doctor, if you have this, first question he's going to ask you, you a smoker? Well, you got lung cancer. It mimics cancer of the lungs. It's suggestive of metastatic malignancy. Sidebar, 2013, the journal Lung. 27 patients who are clinically diagnosed and radiologically diagnosed. Doctor pokes around, looks down in there, says, yep, that's cancer, takes blood, oh, your white blood, x-ray, scans, yep, there's that little knot, it's cancer, sorry. You a smoker? Nope, never smoked in my life, but I live in a moldy home. Nope, that has nothing to do with it. 27 diagnosed patients, 50, 60 years after this book came out, all had biopsies done on them after being diagnosed. All 27 didn't have cancer. All 27 are alive today, four years later, because they went on antifungal drugs. Question, do you think all patients diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer, should be on antifungal drugs? Let me give you the good news. Spornox, the toenail fungus drug, thiabendazole, another antifungal drug, Nizerol, an antifungal drug, and several other drugs have been implicated as cancer treatments, successful cancer treatments. Wait a minute. Treats toenails? And it can stop my breast cancer from metastasizing? Yep, so says science. Powerful science. Major universities. Zoom right over the head of the entire medical association. So that's just page 11. Page 115, localized cutaneous blastomycosis is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. Ever get one of those? As we age, we see these guys running around with Band-Aids. They've been to the dermatologist, and they got all these uh, basal cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas. This says a fungus that's in our air is actually burned into our ears and nose, and it looks for all intents and purposes like cancer. I'll bet you. I have no substantiation of this. I'll bet you most of us getting those little things burned off and called cancer and have to be screened every few months, I'll bet you most of them 
are fungus. If I ever get diagnosed with the squamous cell carcinoma, I'm going to go back and read page 115 of this book again, and I'm going to get some oregano oil. You know what a spot Band-Aid is, the little round ones? Before I go to bed at night, bloop, one drop, peel it, put it on there for three nights, and see what happens. I can always go back to the doctor if it doesn't work. But I'm going to say, Doc, before you start shaving me and cutting me, can I have a week? I'm going to go on Kaufman's diet. I'm going to stop feeding these little fungi that grow on my skin. Remember, fungus grows on and in the dermal layers of the skin. Page, that's not all. Page 153, disseminated histoplasmosis. You got a parakeet? You around chickens? Homing pigeons? Are you around birds at all? Do you ever sweep up under the arches, you know, the old Spanish arches, the, the roofs? Do you ever sweep up the pigeon droppings? And you've been coughing for 53 years? That's called histoplasmosis. Histo, again, God made no mistakes. Bird's poop is black. But God put a device, I believe, in the bird's intestines that, that has the blow-away syndrome with the poop. Otherwise, our earth would be filled. We'd be walking to school through black poop. This stuff that he put in the guts of birds is called histo, histoplasma and capsulatum. This stuff breaks down the poop very quickly. Away it blows in the wind. Away it blows off the leaves, off our roof, off our cars. Away it goes. But it's very toxic for us to inhale it. Okay, so this book says disseminated histoplasmosis. Now get this, you can tell Johns Hopkins, you can see these sophisticated doctors rolling up <coughs> with their meerschaum pipes. Listen to this. This will just prove how smart they are. Disseminated histoplasmosis is found to coexist with leukemia, lymphosarcoma, sarcoidosis, and Hodgkin's disease much more frequently than is statistically justifiable based on coincidence. Hey, you've you got a bird? and you have leukemia, you raise parakeets, and you have lymphosarcoma, you have cancer of the lymph system, it's found to coexist much more frequently than is justifiable based on coincidence. That one sentence blew me away. This fungus mimics leukemia, lymphosarcoma, Hodgkin's disease, Thomas Hodgkin's circa uh, 1829. Do you know he felt the cancer were little cysts, little fungal cysts is what he said. Boy, take his great name and change that today. Oh no, Hodgkin's lymphoma, you gotta get in the doctor immediately. Well, could I try? Hodgkin's said it may be a cyst, it may be a fungal cyst. No, no, Hodgkin's is dead. We need to get you through the system. We need to save your life, man. You got good insurance? What is the hustle when we have these diseases? Page 175, disseminated cryptococcus closely simulates cancer, neoplasm, disseminated four different fungi that your doctor has never heard of, mimicking cancer, okay? Two stories online of women who felt a lump in their breast, and thank God they had doctors that did this, because you probably don't. They do a fine needle aspiration. They go in with a little tiny 26 gauge needle, If it can aspirate, then it's a cyst, because a tumor is a solid mass. Nothing comes up. They aspirated it, and they tested it, and they found it was fungus. Many times, folks, we find, I'm a guy. I go in the shower in the morning and wash under my arms, and one of my fears is someday I'm going to feel a golf ball or a potato under there. Whoa, that hurts. I can't put my arm down. Lymph system under your arms. Um, and if that ever happened to me, I'd ask for a fine needle aspiration, and I'd see what fungus that was. We don't tell women we're going to offer them a differential diagnosis. We don't tell men we're going to offer them a differential diagnosis. We tell them one diagnosis, you have cancer. I think that is erroneous sometimes. I don't know how often. But what do you got to lose to rule out a, a fungal infection? And finally today... That's another slide. I showed the doctors, and I wanted to close with this. Did you know that the three major genera of mycotoxin-producing fungi, three major agricultural, 
Aspergillus, we talked about it. It makes a poison called aflatoxin that can kill you. It can cause cancer. Fusarium. I think one of the most poisonous mycotoxins next to aflatoxin is something called xerelinone. It's in our meat supply. It isn't in the European Union, but it is in America. Um, this frustrates me, but fusarium, remember that one. And penicillium. Penicillium? Three major poisons. The penicillium is what uh, Dr. Fleming in 1928 discovered. Penicillium killed the bacteria in that plate, right? Penicillin is the poison it makes. Antibiotics can cause cancer. I'll never forget Dr. A.V. Costantini with the World Health Organization, who became a friend of mine many, you know, 25, 30 years ago. He's since passed, but not before he wrote a scathing book called Fungal Bionics, Hope at Last. Fungal Bionics, all one word, F-U-N-G-A-L-B-I-O-N-I-C-S. You can still find them from time to time. Get breast cancer, hope at last. In this book, he says, wait a minute, antibiotics are carcinogenic? And he said no doctor would have their patient believe that the billions of antibiotics that have been handed out could be carcinogenic. However, they are by definition a mycotoxin. Fusarium's the mold, penicillin is the mycotoxin and mycotoxins definitely cause cancer. I think you have to be on them for long periods of time. Same with alcohol, which is another mycotoxin. Burr's yeast is the, is the uh, mold. The poison makes is called alcohol. What do we do? Gee, I wonder why I'm growing lumps in my breath. Gee, I'm wondering why my diabetes is off. Gee, you've been diagnosed with what? With lupus? I can't understand why that would be. Come on, folks. We all got to grow up. Now listen to this. The major U.S. crops affected by fungus, corn, be careful, peanuts, be very careful, cotton. We don't eat cotton. Any of you have ears that itch so bad you wish you could pull a Kleenex through it and just... <laughs> you probably used a Q-tip that had a little f fungus on it at one time and you implanted it in your ear. And now every time you go in your left ear to clean it, oh, you just gouge and gouge and gouge. That's an inconvenience. There is a bigger problem here. Cotton is what tampons are made out of. What is toxic shock syndrome? I didn't know how tampons worked, I'm a guy. But I read a story three years ago about a little girl out here in Dallas, Texas, who took a tampon, I guess they're wrapped in paper, she peeled the paper off, whoops, dropped it, it fell on the floor. And the plastic applicator uh, inserter uh, fell off. And she saw this black stuff. And she went and told her mom, what is this? So they tested it, and it was mold. You don't get to peek at it with a tampon before you put it in. Folks, they got this mastered. And they're not being mischievous or devious. This is just the way these things are made. I'm telling you girls, really, think about this. The three major crops affected most by fungus are corn, peanuts, be careful, okay? I'd much rather have, and this is me as a guy saying this, I'd much rather be a little inconvenienced every couple of hours than to be concerned once you put this yeast, once you put fusarium or aspergillus inside your body where it has access to everything, you may get sick. Young girls have died of what they call the tampon syndrome. It's also called toxic shock syndrome. I'm not trying to scare you. I have nothing to gain out of this. I'm trying to teach you. I don't know if you can pull that back and look at it. I don't know. I don't know if it's white, if it's safe, because these filaments sometimes can be deeply embedded in a Q-tip or in a ball of cotton, and you can have a little black strand through there. So all I'm telling you is just, look, a prudent consumer is the most disliked in medicine. You don't walk into your doctor and say, wow, I saw this guy on a tape, and fungus can be killing me. My ear itches like crazy. Could you test it for fungus? The answer is, yeah, he could. But that's called a KOH mount, a, pot a potassium hydroxide mount. He's not going to want to do that. I'm glad to share all this with you. There's some powerful, powerful books out there that talk about this. Watch my news, uh, get a free newsletter. You can sign up on my uh, website, knowthecause.com. Folks, this year I'm going to be giving four more uh, major lectures. I'll be in St. Louis. I'll be in uh, Orlando twice. I'll be in Los Angeles. 
Um, feel free to come see me, shake my hand, say hello to me at any of those. There's a huge one I'm going to be speaking at, Ty Bollinger's, uh, The Truth for Cancer. Man, this guy is on fire. Amazing guy. And I was honored by asking to speak at that one coming up in Orlando. I think it's in October. Uh, so Ty Bollinger, just look for Truth for Cancer, and you'll see I'm on the speaker symposium. This is the kind of thing you're going to want to get more of. Every time I speak to cancer doctors, the coolest thing in the world happens. When I talk about antibiotics inducing cancer, when I talk about fungus mimicking cancer, or 27 patients diagnosed with cancer that didn't have it, they took antifungal medicines and they all got better, the mouths, I'm up on the podium, and here's what you see. They're amazed. These are really, really good people. And for some reason, the most important school, the most important class in their medical school was omitted. Fungus. Think about it. God bless you folks. I'll see you next time. Tell a friend about this show. I'll see you next Tuesday, 3 p.m. Central Time.